And we're talking about Nanooka the North from 1922, directed by Robert Flaherty. Uh, I thought I would just begin talking about this film by pretty well just stating the preface by the director himself that kicks off this uh, documentary of sorts. Nice. This film grew out of a long series of explorations in the North, which I carried out on behalf of Sir William Mackenzie from 1910 to 1916. Much of the exploration was done in journeys lasting months at a time with only two or three Eskimos as my companions. The experience gave me an insight into their lives and a deep regard for them. In 1913, I went north with a large outfit. We wintered on Baffin Island, and when I was not seriously engaged in exploratory work, a film was compiled of some Eskimos who lived with us. I had no motion picture experience, and naturally the results were indifferent. But as I was undertaking another expedition, I secured more negative with the idea of building up this first film. Again, between explorations, I continued with the picture work. After a lot of hardship, which involved the loss of a launch and the wrecking of our cruising boat, we secured a remarkable film. Finally, after wintering a year on Belcher Islands, the skipper, a Moose Factory half-breed, and myself got out to civilization along with my notes, maps, and the films. I had just completed editing the film in Toronto when the negative caught fire and I was minus all. The editing print, however, was not burned and was shown several times just long enough to make me realize it was no good. But I did not see uh, that if I were to take a single character and make him typify the Eskimos, I did see that if I were to take a single character and make him typify the Eskimos, Mm -hmm. as I had known them so long and well, the results would be well worth the while. I went north again, this time solely to make a film. I took with me not only cameras, but apparatus to print and project my results as they were being made, so my character and his family could understand and appreciate what I was doing. As soon as I showed them some of their first results, Nanook and his crowd were completely won over. At last, in 1920, I thought I had shot enough scenes to make the film and prepare to go home. Poor old Nanook hung around my cabin, talking over films as we uh, could make we still could make if I would only stay for another year. He never understood why I should have gone to all the fuss and bother of making the big adji of him. Uh, Less than two years later, I received word that Nanook had ventured into the interior hoping for deer and had starved to death. But our big adji become uh became or become nanook of the north had gone into most of the odd corners of the world and more men than there are stones around the shore of nanook's home have looked upon nanook the kindly brave simple eskimo Uh uh-huh so rj yes how does this movie stack up with walkabout um it's not as depressing as walkabout uh because the animals killed in this movie, it was because these people were fucking eating them. So, like, I'm not a total hypocrite. Like, I know people eat, like, I don't, I'm not a vegetarian. My meat comes from somewhere, right? Yeah. Uh, it was a little, it was pretty depressing, though, watching them fucking pull that walrus uh, or, like, rope it up so it couldn't, like, get back out into the water. That was really sad. Mm-hmm. And then when it's, so, when the walrus mate came to try to help it, Oh my god, man. That's like a fucking Disney short that would like make everyone like bawling before the fucking movie. Well, not the death, but I mean, walrus mates and stuff like that. Um, yeah, no, I didn't really like that stuff. Uh, I didn't like the walrus. I didn't like the seal stuff. Uh, even the stuff with the dogs was kind of like yeah. depressing because like I get it too. It's like, what do you... Like, in their point of view, it was like, they're wild dogs. Dogs fight each other. And it's like, yeah, I know, but fuck. (laughs) Fuck. Yeah, no, I I didn't really like that stuff. But, I mean, what else is new, right? Yeah. So, 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 uh, what did you think of this documentary? Uh, This, 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 uh, this docudrama. Docudrama? Uh, I'll be straight with you, dog. I thought it was fine. Yeah, I mean it's neat because it's almost a hundred years old. But uh, other than that, I don't know. <laughs> I've seen other old documentaries, and those were neat too. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I think the other thing too for us is I don't know about you, but uh, when I was in uh, grade school, uh, we learned about the Inuit people, and we saw stuff like this. Not like documentaries, but my point, I guess, is it's not like new to me. We live in Canada. Mm-hmm. We are Eskimos, like, in everyone else's eyes. So. <laughs> blubber eaters. We are Blu- in- uh, Inuit. <laughs> Inuit blubber eaters. Hey, at least there was some clarification here. Is like people think they eat the blubber, but yeah. it's really just used like butter. Exactly. And uh, oil. So, the, uh, no, the I th- more you know. 
the more you know, man. No, I thought it was fine. I mean, I don't think there's anything like groundbreaking about it other than the fact that it's really fucking old. Well, so. it, I mean, okay. So I guess like the context of this is, I mean, it's kind of regarded as like kind of the first like commercially successful film of its kind where okay. like up to this point, like, so there was like, I mean, the idea of like where documentary film begins is kind of like nebulous because no one actually had that term. Like, I guess like the term documentary Flaherty actually came up with like four years after this was made. Oh, um, so up to this point, I mean, you had films like in the 1800s, like the late 1800s, where it's like, hey, let's just set this camera up in like film, like industrial workers leaving this factory. Like right. that, that was like, well, what is that? Well, it's like documenting, uh, like real life, uh, like documenting uh-huh. flowers, documenting cityscapes, people walking around corners. I mean, that's sort of like the first things that people were really doing. Um, and then uh, you get like Georges Malise, uh on the flip side, who started like making these like these little short films of like, like magician acts and like deals with the devil. Um, and those were kind of like the two separate strains. So then you have something like this documentary, Nanook of the North, um, which kind of crosses those two things where it's like, Hey, I'm going to present this completely hostile alien landscape that like is completely alien to like the vast majority of people who are going to watch it. And it's going to be like, um, I don't know. We're going to use this to like, uh, sell tickets um at make the end money of the, make money it's like it's i mean it was a commercial venture at the end of the day i don't think it started out that way um mm-hmm. because like i mean obviously he st- well he started off to go do this because he wanted to make money so uh sir william mckenzie that he me- me- mentions in the preface he was a like railroad uh like builder, like entrepreneur, yeah. kind of guy, uh, and they were looking at these, like this region, as far as like, hey, go find some iron, go see if there's any natural resources that we can go exploit, and he gets sent up there as a surveyor. Hey, brings and, and the idea was like, hey, just go bring some cameras with you and go film it, so we know what it looks like, because film like did this new technology was still like relatively new. It was only like 20 years old at this point. Uh, yeah. when, when life was a lot slower. Um, and so it's, so he went up there, he filmed a bunch of stuff and he kind of went, yeah, I kind of want to go back and do this again. And he did do it like three times, obviously. Cause, huh. um, so he went back three times or a total of three times. And the, the third time is what we get. Um, and, um, so I was reading about him cause I was kind of curious about Robert Flaherty. Cause I imagine that people have varying opinions like this idea that because he's often considered like the father of documentary filmmaking and uh-huh. it's like what he's making here i don't even know if you could qualify it as documentary like it's not purely documentary because uh as i was reading obviously uh there's like one of the stories of with nanook that or one of the controversies that go, always goes along with it is the stagedness of things um for, yeah. in, for instance uh so nanook was not this guy's name um and that isn't yeah. his family those were actors <laughs> They were like, what? He, yeah, those those were all uh, people from that community that he just said, hey, they're like photogenic. They're going to be the family now, and we're going to go and we're going to we're going to create like we're like because obviously he's not like making this up. Like he's not making up yeah. Inuit people. He's not making up how they live, but he is taking liberties with like how things are playing out. Um, sure. So like I mean, there's like the obvi- there's like obvious scenes where it's like, hey, all these people are coming out of the kayak. <laughs> And it's like, it's like a Buster Keaton's like silent film gag. Like it's so. Yeah. It's like a clown car. Like they keep pulling people out of there. And then the dog too. (laughs) Oh yeah. The cute dogs that you later learn are just like a commodity. Yeah. So, I mean, there's like, like, I mean, I didn't realize that, oh, like they're all actors. Like they're, they're not, not actors, but they're like not what are presented as this like family unit that are like nomadic uh, hunter gatherers. Um, Sure. So. This is the thing I'll have to read because uh, so the I didn't know this until I read I read the essay that accompanied this uh, Criterion release uh, by a Dean Duncan, great name. Um, oh. So this is a selection I'll read for you. Uh, nevertheless, uh-huh. the film is full of faking and fudging in one form or another. Observers, starting with John Grierson, would come to accuse Flaherty of ignoring reality in favor of a romance that was, for all its documentary purpose value, irrelevant. The family at the Uh film center was not at all. These were photogenic Inuit, cast and paid to play these roles. The characters' authentic clothes were actually a nostalgic hybrid. The Inuit had started to integrate Western wear sometime previously. This integration was in fact quite general. Igloos were giving way to southern building materials. Many harpoons had been replaced by rifles. Many kayak paddles by motors. 
The seal had uh, the seal that appears to be engaging Nanook in a delightful tug of war is actually dead. Nanook is in fact being pulled around by friends at the other end of the rope, standing just off camera. Uh, and <laughs> this one is. Uh, during the famous walrus hunt, the hunters desperately oh. ask the filmmaker to stop shooting the camera and start shooting the rifle. For his part, Flaherty pretended not to hear and kept filming until the prey was taken in the old way. A failed bear hunt, not appearing in the film, but related in Flaherty's northern memoir, My Eskimo Friends, left its participants, Flaherty included, stranded and nearly starving for weeks. Um. <laughs> fuck. fuck that, man. That, that stuff makes it like so much worse for me because mm-hmm. when I was like, I didn't think it was state. Like there were some things I was like, okay, he was probably like, Hey, do this and do that. But like the fact that it was like, Hey man, go kill that fucking walrus. Well, I mean, they would have, they, I mean, they would have probably, they had to do it anyways. Do it. Well, but I mean, I mean it's, this is a strange situation, right? Cause like, so I was reading, like he was staying at a, where is it? Um, it's like Port Harrison, which is like, they were like yeah. filming in like Northern Quebec. And like, I think that's where they were based out of. There was like a fur trading uh, post there. And that's like kind of where he was based out of. Cause I mean, there's like ama- incredible things to consider with this film. This idea of like going up there with like the camera equipment that was available yeah. at that time, like massive cameras, like your own like film reels. And you don't, it's not like you have a film crew doing all this stuff with you. You're like out there by yourself. And like, again, one of the most extreme like climates in the yeah. world it's like working yeah, like a yeah. camera hitch stuff it's like it's kind of amazing from that regard um but yeah there's like i mean as far as like a like ethics of like documentary filmmaking this like blows all those things but of course when he was making this none of that existed um yeah and he, yeah yeah and so his whole thing though so him as a person he kind of like falls into this like thing of like that mid like like turn of turn of the century early 20th century like mentality of like these guys like a lot of painters were like this like um they're like these like pantheist spiritualists like uh, wassily kandinsky uh there's like the group of seven artists like lauren harris um there's like this one painter friends mark like there are all these guys that are really into mm-hmm. spiritualism and this idea of like uh finding like a spiritual core that wasn't like like Christian or anything like that per se, but going into nature and finding it. And one of the things they associate with like this purity of the spirit that's like being bogged down in like the modernist world is like the is primitive people. So right. there's this thing of like Robert Flaherty going into this area, finding these people that he obviously like really like was like, uh, like, I don't know. He was really interested in, he loved these guys and he wanted to like, film their life before it disappeared i th- like that's one of the arguments that like yeah. why he did this I it's get like, it. right so there's like this romanticism to it um yeah and I get it so i mean he's staging these things like to a degree where it's like hey yeah you should use harpoons and classic means like because no one will know like that you don't actually use these things necessarily anymore because why would you use this when it's way more efficient to use a gun from a, a gun. distance and it's way more effective um and yeah. like hey use the rifle we're killing his walrus like this is like horrible get it out of the way he's like what i can't hear you you gotta kill it the old fashioned way. And it's like yeah. it's for, he's creating it for effect and it's like, ah, oh, buddy, that's just horrendous. Well, <laughs> well, that's what I mean. I was like, the saddest part about that was like how long it was. You're just like, come on. Yeah. Well, even just like so... even like yeah, yeah, that, there's that. And then like as you said, like yeah, the seal thing. It's like now, now that I know it's like, well, the seal is dead, and then like they did this whole staging of it, it's like, okay. Uh there's that but then there's like the dogs which is like it's a that's a weird one too because it's like yeah. nowadays like when you see like if you see a video of like a guy kicking an animal it's like a PETA video that's like been secretly recorded it's not like yeah. this is like being shown at like the multiplex of the period of time like uh yeah. like people were lining up to go Ooh. see these sites that they could never imagine because like mm-hmm. I mean, so I mean going into the film I guess like I mean it presents like this magical ice kingdom of horribleness like it's, it's, yeah. like, it's supposed to like make you feel pretty good about where you live I guess um yeah and yeah totes 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 Uh, mm -hmm. (laughs) um another thing i get this uh, robert flaherty he just seems like a quite the guy so uh here's another bit this is from wikipedia uh melanie mcgrath a writer writes that while living in northern quebec for the year of filming nanook flaherty had an affair with his lead actress the young inuk woman who played nanook's wife a few months sure. after he left she gave birth to his son uh, uh josephy um whom he never acknowledged. Uh, Josephy was one of the Inuit who were relocated in the 1950s to the very difficult living conditions in Resolute, uh, which is uh, code for residential schools. 
Oh. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, according to McGrath, Flaherty knew of his son's difficulties, but took no action. Uh, corroboration of yeah. McGrath's account is not readily available, and Flaherty himself never discussed the matter. So, it's like, it's hearsay. I guess to even throw yeah. it out there, but I, it's like not in remotely surprising that this would happen. Like one of those things that like I've heard is that like, like Inuit culture is like far more like it's fairly permissive. Um, I'm not sure if it'd be permissive to the point that they'd be like, Hey, white guy, come on here. But I remember like from like when I was reading about the Franklin expedition, it was very much like that. They did not have like, yep. I mean, and of course like this is like a common thing amongst like uh, these like colonial stories, like from the Victorian era. It's like these guys traveling to Tahiti or uh, whatever. They're like, they're like, Hey, these women just will have sex with me. And it's like, this is wonderful. <laughs> of course they will. Uh, of course they will. Well, they're just like, yeah. 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 It's like, well, you're interesting. You're unique in this landscape of like, of, desert snow hell and yeah. um so yeah <sighs> i don't know so that's like one of those things i'm like that wouldn't surprise yeah. me in the least um and it's like yeah there's that whole aspect of um uh, living in canada we have a horrible history of uh of white people and the first nations people and so this oh, is just, yeah and this is just like kind of a part of that i mean so um Flaherty was American, but it seemed like he spent a lot of time in Canada. He was quite the outdoorsman. Uh, he lived yeah. like he apparently like liked being outside a lot. He had been his, he raised his family like in the wilderness. Uh-huh. So I mean, he was like an adventurer with a camera. Um, huh. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, do you have any notes you'd like to share about this film? I've been talking a lot. I don't know, man. I I like I made notes of like things. Like, uh, that kid's sick, and then they just give him a big spoon of castor oil. That's pretty fucked up. <laughs> it's like, it's like I can't even imagine just drinking, like, a cup of castor oil. I, mean, I know that was, like, a real thing, but it's, like, gross. Yeah, that's a form of torture uh, depicted in yeah. Amarcord. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, I thought the intro in the written stuff, when he calls that one guy a moose factory half-breed, I thought yeah. that was really funny. <laughs> Um, it's of its era. <laughs> it's of its era. Uh, all the babies and like the backpacks and the hoodies. That's super cute. Oh yeah, the sack uh, of the sack of huskies. Sack of huskies. Yeah, that's uh, all very super cute. Um, the human toboggans was super cute. Mm-hmm. Uh, when he made the little snow bears for the kid to shoot little practice arrows at, that was super cute. Oh, that's the, that was actually one of my like. I thought that was kind of wicked. This idea of like living in this like again like. The, the Arctic, um, like you don't yeah. have toys, but like you, you can make toys. You can make whatever make you it, want make out, it of, out, of, out snow. of the snow. Yeah, you yeah. make it out of the snow and ice, and you just bit here. Here's a here's a polar bear. Make it. Yeah, and the idea that it was like the kid was getting cold because of course, and then the dad was like, ha, 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 ha. he's like, rub my cheeks, son. That's right. Yeah, so that was pretty cool. Um, and then making the igloo i thought was really neat to see and mm-hmm. like the ice window like that's yeah. some pretty neat shit man ingenious and ingenious what what a twist <laughs> and then uh the i thought the way that this guy fishes is just fucking insane and in that once he gets the fish he uh kills it just by biting into its fucking brain mm-hmm. i i haven't seen that very often so that was new <laughs> for me well maybe we'll be watching it when we get to uh fishing with john Oh, God. <laughs> I have no idea. Okay. Well, yeah, no, that's it. Like, that stuff I thought was, like, cool. Like, it's, I don't know, it's it's neat or it's, like, interesting to see any, like, old culture or, like, lifestyle or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I was like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> sure. I mean, yeah, it's not like this, like, I don't think it's like a... Something I don't think anyone goes back to watch. Like, oh, I got to go back and check out Nanuko the North. I guess yeah. if, if you want to watch, like, uh, I mean, I think it's like a fairly pretty good looking documentary. Like, I mean, it's got like a great vibe to it because it doesn't look like anything else is going to look. Like, you could watch like a silent film depicting the Arctic, but it would be all st- like staged and like it would like literally be staged and like it'd be sets and people would be like, walking around and they wouldn't actually seem like it was that cold. But like watching yeah. this, you're like, oh, wow, this is like a, a place that I've never been, a place I'll probably never be, um, even though I could walk out my front door and it's very similar currently. Um right. But yeah, so I mean, there's like that kind of escapism, and I mean, that's sort of like 
what I think this thing was on offer to do in general. Like that's what most people would have gotten out of the, at that time. Um, like, we, like we talked about the Franklin expedition, it seems like a few times uh, on this show, yeah. but like that was like, all the time. That, like a few years ago. I mean, I was really interested in it. Uh, there's this really great book called the Arctic grail by uh, Canada's own uh, Robert uh, Breton. And uh, it's a great history of it. Uh, just ex- explaining the horrors of like Arctic exploration. Uh, it gets mm-hmm. you into the, like the mindset of like, like looking for this Northwest Passage thing, which was like a complete bunk idea from the get go. Uh, it, it would yeah. never work, and now it exists because of uh, things like uh, climate change. <laughs> and uh, so now uh-huh. it's now it's quite possible, but it would still be ineffective uh, to ship things that way. The, yeah. Um, but yeah, like I always like thought about like Arctic exploration. It's like kind of like going to the moon. Um, like it's like huh. you you have to be like essentially like so like shielded up like your whatever garments you're wearing that's like your spacesuit you're in a little spaceship going into the middle of nowhere and there's no right. food um and, and, right. and then of course yeah you're out there stranded uh but then there's these weird little people that live there these like inuit folk who like yeah. make a lit who are like healthy they're like well fed and it's like well what are they doing to do that well uh, initially, uh, explorers had no idea, and they're like, "Well, that's disgusting. I'm not going to eat raw animal. Why would you yeah. eat this?" And it's like, "Well, that's the that's the vitamin C, and that's what that's why you don't get scurvy in a land without trees or vegetables, other than like uh-huh. moss that you use for fuel." Um, so I mean, yeah, I mean, what, when you watch this stuff, like, there's like that weird patronizing colonial tone that like tip. It's like typical of the era. Um, yeah. And so, like, I'm not sure, like, how that plays in our 20th, 21st century eyes. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. They're, I don't know. It's, like, interesting. I mean, I watched this, like, several yeah. years ago, kind of, like, when I was, like, just checking out things in the Criterion Collection and, like, interested in, like, silent film. And, oh, it's, like, the first documentary, kind of, in my, what I thought of at the time was, like, the first documentary. And so I checked it out, and I was, like, oh, neat. And then, I mean, I don't really need yeah. to, I don't need to watch it again. Watched it for the show was kind of like, oh my God, I don't remember all yeah. the animals being fucking beaten and kicked and killed. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, RJ has to watch this now. And I'm, yeah. I'm going to have to hear about it from RJ. <laughs> no, I, I'll tone it down. People know my opinion. Yeah. People know my opinion. Yeah. We, we so, know where you stand. <laughs> yeah, you know where I stand, but yeah, I well, don't know. And like I said, like, it's like very different here too, because it's like, well, these like they have to do this. Like there is yeah, no, other no I, I yeah. get, I right. get that too. But yeah. then f- finding out that a lot of or some of it was staged, it's like, well, yeah, it, well, that really fucking sucks. Yeah, it adds that layer. But it's again, this is like a very similar thing though, because um, like with Walkabout, how he made the comment, like no one really seems to talk about that animal cruelty and because yeah. this so this is again another roger ebert great movies film um he watching well uh he's he calls nanook one of the most vital and unforgettable human beings ever recorded on film fuck off roger <laughs> ebert. well good, good thing he's dead right yeah because i would i would have qualms with him i'd, t- I'd call him up right now i'd say listen here egbert i got a problem with what you're throwing down baby well, yeah, I mean, like, I don't even really, like, did Nanook have that much of a character? He just seems like, uh, he's, no. he's, a, he's a guy. He doesn't talk. He doesn't, like, you don't get to hear him, like, say anything. He just smiles. Oh, we get to see him. I, well, I mean, again, the stageness of him. What's a gramophone? What's this record? Yeah. I better try eating it. <laughs> uh, the, silly es- the silly Eskimo. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, all right. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I know. Oh, oh, the other one that, like, is so missable, too, is, like, oh, well, where's that Arctic fox going? That scene where, like, he, like, goes into the ground, he grabs that Arctic fox thing, like, out uh-huh. of it, and he just, like, t- they tie it up onto the toboggan, and it's, like, hissing, and I'm, like, uh, I was, like, really, like, oh, shit, is this going to turn all cannibal holocaust? But it's, like, no, they're just taking him away, and I'm, like, yeah. well, where's he going? Is he the new pet? Like, I don't understand. Like, I know what's going to happen. I know what uh-huh. those those pelts go for at the old trading post that they bring in for candy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Not rifles, obviously. Why would you need rifles? No, they want what was it like uh highly colorful candy or like decorative yeah. candy yes. or some yeah, shit yeah, like yeah, that. No, That's no. how they described it. Yeah. Um what did you think of the uh the uplifting score, the the silent audio accompaniment? Oh, it was revolutionary. It's so weird um watching silent films with like those. Like I, I kind of yeah. come to expect them now. 
Um, and uh-huh. you always get like some like alleged like expert to do the like composition or whatever and do it. Right. But it's always like fine. Like it's just like kind of there. But now there's like been a shift in like kind of in the last 20 years to like have more like moody, like synthy sounds, uh-huh. um, which is like also like, well, it maybe plays a little bit better, but sometimes they don't really put a lot of money into like recording the stuff. So they just do, do it all in a computer rather than like having like a real like orchestra where you actually get like a real sound to it. So it always has like that fake digital sound over top of silent films just the way the director intended yeah just how like it was in the arctic just like it that was ca- in the arctic that music was playing all the time mm-hmm. all the time baby all the time yeah there's one documentary i guess like on uh flaherty that uh i did not know about until like like a half hour before we started recording called a boatload of wild irishmen uh, which apparently is a reference to one of his own quotes about like him being accused of like drowning or trying to drown a boatload of wild Irishmen. Cause so Flaherty, uh. after he made this, um, he kind of jumped around. He like, where did he go? He went to Samoa. He made a documentary there uh, called Moana. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> um, yeah. There's the, the South Seas. Uh, he went to make some stuff there, islands of Ireland and stuff like that. But, like, they all kind of failed. Like, he never really got super successful again because it seemed like he's one of those guys who really wanted to become immersed in, like, these cultures and, like, hang out for a while and just film things. Um, right. But, like, this is, like, a commercial business, baby, making movies. So you got to, like, be quick. Got to make your make, make your stuff and move get out of there. And so he, like, kind of would do stuff and they, like, get taken away from him and get re-edited. And so, I mean, he mm-hmm. never like really like became anything too big. He worked with, uh, uh, Murnau, uh, on a, I think it's taboo. Who? Uh, uh, FW Murnau, director of Nosferatu and, um, stuff like that. that All right. That fella. Okay. Um, you've never heard of FW Murnau? Nah, I'll take your word for it though. Oh my God. Oh, uh, anyway. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Flaherty kind of just did like, kept making documentary stuff. I think he got better at like, uh, everything, obviously. I, I think before yeah. he made Nanuka the North, he apparently someone I read somewhere I read like he went to three weeks of like cinematography school in Rochester. But I'm like, there was a cinematography school. <laughs> like to me, I'm like, was, yeah, is this some guy in his like garage with a camera that he got from France? And he's like, yeah, I'll show you how to use this. But I, I probably, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I but, don't know, man. But you know what I know. It's time to talk what? about who hates Nanuga the North. Probably a few people. Uh, yeah, there's some or diff- there's some different. If there's tastes. anyone who's watched it, even like who hate who people who watch it have to hate it. I don't know. No, I just mean oh. like it, I, I can't imagine there's a terribly a, a big amount of uh, people who've even seen this fucking movie. So I, I think because it's in the Criterion Collection, because it has like historical uh, stature, I think it does get watched. But right. uh, Ingen gave this one star. Uh, and wrote uh, two sections. One's called likes and one's called dislikes. Likes reads, see below. Dislikes. There was not much to like about this film. The cinematography was poor. Its subjects were treated in a patronizing manner. Some of the action was obviously staged. Dogs were kicked. Oh, those sound that, those sound delicious, my friend. I'm sorry. I'm trying. Animals were slaughtered. It quickly became boring after the novelty wore off. And then it just sort of ended. That is true. It just, just yeah, sort that of ended. Yes, it just kind of, oh, did they make it? They don't even like show them like emerging from the igloo in the warmth again. No, well, they, they, it just ends. They bury the lead in the start where it's just like, well, one day he just walked off and then died. He, he, but he they never, never show it. Well, no, because they left already by that point. Yeah. They, they could have restaged that, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Poor man. Yeah. I don't know why this guy's on about cinematography. I mean, I think it looks great. Like considering what it is, it's yeah, like, it's a 1922 like documentary. Well, that's what, I mean. what do you fucking expect, man? Like Terrence Malick, like uh, Roger Deakins coming in, like with beautiful stuff. Like I thought it looked good too. I don't know. Yeah, like yeah, it's really like I mean, that's like one of the most memorable things about it. It's like yeah, that yeah. like that's what the Arctic looks like, and I mean yeah, yeah, it's like it, it's fine. <laughs> what a weird complaint. Yeah. Um, one star from Ethne. Uh, even if you know nothing about Inuit culture and customs, this documentary is easily uh-huh. outed as as complete bullshit based simply on its own internal inconsistencies, and it's horribly shot. What? Why? <laughs> do do people equate like old f- film uh, as horribly like shot? Like that's dumb. 
it's like when people say things are badly edited. It's like yeah, sometimes like, like oh, what do you what do you mean? Like I've seen bad editing. I've seen Tomb Raider. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like where did you go to film or like film editing school? Yeah, film. Tell buff. me. Yeah. Tell me. Uh, and then Lee. here we've got Michael Samberdyke, two stars. I had always heard of Nanook of the North, and now I have finally seen it. <laughs> Oh, yep. finally. <laughs> there were compelling moments in the film, most notably the making of an igloo and the way the sled dogs got excited when a seal was slaughtered. Just, well, that was like one dog growling angrily. Yeah, uh, and I'm pretty sure with the stage stuff, he probably like yelled at the dog. Mm-hmm. Or like was like, hey, you want some meat? Huh? I'm going yeah. ki- to kick you, dog, or whip you. <laughs> yeah, I don't uh, think it was the whiff of blood in the air. Mm-hmm. However, there was no personality to this film. I developed no sense of who uh-huh. any of the Eskimos were were beyond dad mom kids i wasn't sure of why they were traveling the tra- soundtrack made for compelling listening but if it hadn't been so good my interest in the film would have really diminished further all right no yeah. i don't all know right. i mean it's fine like i mean it it's in i mean it's engaging enough uh like it's paced well i don't know yeah. what, i don't know what else do you really want or expect for this it's like <laughs> it's like a historical object ultimately yeah. um it's not like easy viewing or anything like that um no. i mean it would kind of it's kind of like the uh the godfather though of like kind of like mondo exploitation documentaries that the italians would later like get into in like the 60s and 70s and mondo Conti and stuff like that because those movies are packed full of animal violence and like animals oh, being yeah. killed and monkey brains and shit like that um it's a it's a great 20th century pastime the killing of animals to people just going ooh I can't believe ooh. that because we can't show real people getting killed we can only show animals yes yeah. as they eat their hot dog in the theater yeah having their pop corn eating their hot dog yeah, yeah. great <sighs> any last thoughts um no being cold sucks yep Imagine being cold all the time and blowing your nose all the time. All the time. Poor sick yeah. RJ. This is truly the darkest timeline. <laughs> One day we'll figure out a mute button. But hey, yeah. we're going to hang up the mucklucks over the break and warm our naked bodies against one another for heat. Mucklux.